Good morning. This is week two of Advent, and it's hope. And I'm reading the scripture from John 1, starting at verse 6 through 9. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Reading from verses 15 and 16, John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. Yeah. Reading from verses 19 through 23. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, he said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Jesus is the Messiah. There is no other Savior, Lord, or Messiah than Jesus. This was the message of John the Baptist, who was also known as the forerunner of the Messiah. While John was a great man who led many to repentance, John clearly stated that he was not the Messiah. Just as David referred to the Messiah as his Lord, so John calls Jesus the one who is greater than him because he was before John. As well, we are to live our lives like John, doing the works of God, pointing people to Jesus. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received the blessing, one after another. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that you give us the insight to follow the example of John the Baptist and place you before all others in our lives. And may the power of your Holy Spirit be with us. Amen. Amen. Um, tonight is our monthly prayer time. And as I was reading, um, I don't know why, I guess they sent me this because I'm over 60, I guess. <laughs> but through, our, through the Assemblies of God, they put out this time called Prime Line Senior Adult Ministry. So I got my first copy this month. I and mean, then whatever, and I'm trying not to take it personal. <laughs> but anyway, in the back, there was an area there on heavenly prayers. And uh, so the reason we come together on Sunday nights and pray once a month is because prayer is a vertical communication to God. And, we, and when we come together, we're lifting our voices up to God. God hears and he answers prayer. There's something powerful when God's people come together collectively and we lift all of our voices vertically to God. Amen. And we have to watch ourselves because sometimes we get in prayer and prayer goes from vertical to horizontal. We like people to hear what we're telling God. And we think if we can impress people, somehow God will move on our behalf. But prayer is just when we cry out to God. And when we keep prayer vertical, when we keep that time vertical, just lifting up and crying out to God in intercession, something great happens. We may, what, there was about missionaries and going, the battle in the heavenly realms. This little art, I just want to read this to you. We may not all be called to physically go to such places around the world, but we're all absolutely compelled to do battle in the heavenly realm, interceding on behalf of those who do not know the Lord and those who do not and and those protection for those who are called to go into the land of embattlement 
physically. The Holy Spirit stands by ready to partner with us as we pray. He who compels us will also equip us. Amen? But I want you to listen to this. This is a statement by William Booth, the founder of Salvation Army. And it says this, not called, did you say? Not heard the call? I think you should say. Put your ear down to the Bible and hear him bid you to go pull sinners out of the fire of sin. Put your ear down to the burdened, agonized heart of humanity and listen to its pitiful wail for help. Go stand by the gates of hell and hear the damned entreat you to go to their father's house and bid their brothers and sisters and servants and masters not to come there. Look to Christ in the face whose mercy you have professed to obey and tell him whether you will join heart and soul and body and circumstances in the march to publish his mercy to the world. Wow, what a challenge. Amen? And so tonight, we're just going to come together. We're going to vertically lift our voices up to God. We're going to intercede. We're going to intercede for our nation, for our leaders. We're going to intercede for the lost. We just want to lift our voices up. As God lays things on our heart, the intercessor, that's what he does. God puts a burden on our heart, and then we cry out to God, and he moves in response to our prayers. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. So that's tonight. So we invite you to join us here at 630. And it's so powerful uh, when we come together and pray corporately. Lest you can pray at your house. There's something about gathering together and praying together. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I just want to say thank you uh, in your giving. Uh, as you've noticed, as we started into this and we talked about But we're desiring to become a church that is intentional and purposeful in our giving and living by generosity. Amen? And so if you want to give, you have to purposely find a box. You have to make sure you do it. So we're growing up past the reminder of the bucket. We've matured beyond the bucket. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're just living on purpose and believing God. And I want to thank you. We're only $17,000 away from going over our goal for this year of $100,000. So God's going to do it. Amen? How many believe God's going to do it? How many believe God's going to use you to do it? Yeah, there you go. Hallelujah. That's the way he works in the earth. Praise God. Well, did you bring your Bibles? Amen. Make this declaration with me. This is my Bible. I live by its truth. I walk in its light. I rest in its promises. I'm empowered by its love. I overcome by the faith produced from receiving this seed sown into my heart. Father, I thank you today for your word that works in our life. I thank you for the word that is planted in our hearts. And I thank you, Father, for the word that changes us and conforms us into the image of your Son, Holy Spirit, do your work in us today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, yes, hallelujah. God is good. Amen? If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're shifting it up just a little bit on communion. But as I was preparing this, and we're continuing on in, in part of this series on winning the battle against unbelief. Winning the battle, fighting and winning the battle against unbelief. And we're in such an uh, amazing uh, era today in things that are going on. Uh, it's just so important that we learn to live by faith. Amen? You know, the Bible says in the last day that, that everything that can be shaken will be shaken, and uh, so there's a whole lot of shaking going on. Amen. So uh, we want to make sure that we're strong, that we're secured, and that we're living by faith in this area. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to read verses 23 through 26, and I'm tying this in around the subject of covenant this morning. Last week we shared with you with Bartimaeus, calling out to Jesus, Jesus, our son of David, have mercy on on me, and that is a covenant cry, and uh, Lord willing, we'll continue to integrate some more teaching just on covenant, but he here's the issue. You have a covenant with God, and uh, so if I told you that you had a relative who had written you into their will, and uh, they had left you an inheritance, but uh, I, you're going to have to read the will to find out what you have inherited,
well, could you read it and tell me what it says? No, it's your inheritance. It's your inheritance. And so you should want to know enough to read your own will to understand what your inheritance is. And then once you read your name in the will and you see that something's been willed to you, something has been willed to you, declared to be yours, and certified by the death of the tester. It's not yours until that one dies, but once they die, what they've declared is yours becomes yours. The same as it was theirs before they died. Which means you now have full ownership of what they gave to you. Are you doing all right? And so that's Christianity. God has written you into his will. And he willed it to you through the life of his son. And now Jesus as the tester, Hebrews tells us has now passed away, so now that will is in force. So everything that's willed to you is now yours in Christ. Amen. It's not something you have to beg for, grovel for, whine for, cry for. Amen. Wouldn't that be an interesting sight at a lawyer's office? At the reading of the will. Some, well, I just don't feel worthy. That all the stuff that Christians do to try to receive what is theirs in God's declared will for them, all the gyrations, all the emotion, everything we go through, instead of just saying, thank you, I receive. Thank you, I receive. Thank you, I, I believe that you have given that to me, and I receive it. How many know that if your name is written in a will, you don't have to believe it, it's yours whether you believe it or not. It doesn't have anything to do with you, believe. It's declared yours. That's exactly what God has done for you. Everything in this book is what God has declared is yours. And He declared it through the body and the blood of His Son. And if I ever get through the battle of unbelief, of talking myself out of my inheritance, my life will change. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup. After supper, saying, This cup is the new what? covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink in remembrance drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes every time we receive communion we're saying I have my inheritance I'm remembering the will has been ratified. Amen. Now the devil likes to contest your right to inherit. He wants to talk you out of your inheritance. But every time you take the communion elements and we remember the Lord's life and his death, we're declaring, no, you're too late. I know I'm a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I've been made a joint heir. Praise the Lord. We're all equal heirs. Amen. Amen. I just think about that. that one of the greatest things, uh, uh, that, the, the, one of the most, well, I won't say greatest thing. Well, the greatest thing is the equality of our inheritance. The dumbest thing that you see is when people in the natural squabble over inheritance. And we get jealous of each other in, in issues in family and everything else. But it's interesting in the body of Christ, you'll watch in, in Christian, they think other people got a better inheritance than they got. Everybody look up here just for a minute. Y'all got the same. Everybody got exactly the same. If you, don't, if you aren't walking in the same, it's your fault. Amen. I'm tired of God getting blamed. Amen. I, I'm, I'm going on a slap line move for God. Amen. There's several things I, feel I get over slapping people on. I mean, they're different things. But blaming God for you not having something is terrible. 
Amen. In fact, I love this this morning, and I've been working on this all week and, uh, for, for today. And then this morning, I read the devotional with Oswald Chamber. So I'm just going to read it to you this morning, because just on covenant and dealing with this, then we're going to dive into this. This is Genesis 9.13. I do not set my bow in the cloud. It shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. God, that says the rainbow is that I've made a covenant between me and the earth. So listen, it's the will of God that human beings should get into moral relationship with him. And his covenants are for this purpose. So that you and I would enter into relationship with God through covenant. Why does God not save me, someone asked. He has saved me, but I have not entered into relationship with him. Why does not God do this and that? He has done it. The point is, will I step into covenant relationship? All the great blessings of God are finished and complete, but they are not mine until I enter into a relationship with him on the basis of covenant. Jesus says, this is the blood of the new covenant that I'm making with you. God didn't ask you to enter into a relationship with him based on emotion, based on your feeling. Covenant has nothing to do with feelings. If you got a will, it would have nothing to do with how you feel about the will. It's written in black and white. No feelings are involved. It's just a declaration of truth. That's the way the word... Once you move in Christianity past your emotional feelings, things will change. Listen to this next part. Waiting for God is incarnate unbelief. Unbelief made flesh. Waiting for God is unincarnate unbelief. It means that I have no faith in Him. I wait for Him to do something in me that I may trust in that. Wow. God, do something in me so I can trust in what you did instead of you. I said, I don't feel so all alone now when I preach this stuff. <laughs> so why? But watch this. God will not do it because that is not the basis of the God and man relationship. Man has to go out of himself in his covenant with God just as God goes out of himself in his covenant with man. We're celebrating Christmas. God came out of himself to come as a man to enter into covenant with you. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. Oh, that's, that's good right there. We'll just go home right now. <laughs> but you have to get out of your life to enter into a covenant relationship with God. Amen? Go with me to Hebrews chapter 8 real quick. I'm going to read all these scriptures to you. Hebrews chapter 8, I'm going to start reading while you keep turning. They're all in your Bible, in your outline. You can read them later if you don't get there with me. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6, but now. Somebody shout, but now. But now. Great study, the but nows of the Bible. But now, Jesus, speaking of Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch also as he is a mediator of a better covenant which is established on better promises. Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant Established on better promises. A mediator is a go-between, a reconciler, or an intercessor. If you look back just a couple of verses, Hebrews 7.25, Therefore, speaking of Christ, he is also able to save to the uttermost those whom, who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. When Jesus intercedes for you, he intercedes on the basis of the covenant that he made between him and the Father on your behalf, and you're a joint heir to, and you have inheritance in. He's always declaring your inheritance before the Father. Amen. He's interceding on behalf of your inheritance. Are you doing all right? Amen. Look at chapter 9 and verse 15. It says, and for this reason, he is a mediator of the new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. We have an eternal inheritance 
in Christ. Look at chapter 12, if you would. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24 says this. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks of better things than that of Abel. Amen. 1 Timothy 2, 5. There is one mediator between God and man. That is Christ Jesus, our Lord. So you have a mediator. What is he doing? God, the Lord is mediating. He, he's reconciling and he's interceding on our behalf based on his covenant. Amen? And so pressing through on this is so important for us. Lastly, chapter 13 and verse 20. It says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood. Somebody say, through the blood. blood. Of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever Amen. Praise the Lord. So God is working in us. He is a covenant God. He has set covenant. His covenant is His will. It's called a new, the New Testament. A testament is a will. And so God has made a New Testament, a new will concerning you. He's written your name in it. And He's made you an heir to it through Christ. The moment you receive Christ, you become an heir to it. Go with me to Galatians chapter 3. You want some more? Amen. Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 19. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgression until the seed, Christ, should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hands of a mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one only. Amen. Thank God for that. Amen. But God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has, has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Verse 23. But before faith came... We were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterwards be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Remember, we're talking about the battle against unbelief. The just shall live by faith. Faith has come. Now by faith, we believe and we receive. Amen? So we're living by faith. We're standing on the Word of God. We're declaring the Word of God. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Turn to the right, just a couple of pastors, and you get to Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 19. Now, there, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fit together, grows into a holy temple, and you are being built together for a dwelling place by God in the Spirit. We're, we're, we're no longer separated. Go back to verse 11. Therefore remember that you were once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hand. That at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. So before we get saved, we're separated from covenant, having no hope and without God in the world. But what? Verse 13, but now in Christ, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So, Pastor, what you, why are you preaching like this this morning? Because so many times when we take communion, we just lightly pass over what's happening. We are remembering we have a covenant with God. 
You have a covenant with God. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you're just a listener, if you come to church, you're just trying to be nice. You have no covenant. I'm serious. You have a covenant. Covenant is relationship. It's relationship. It's commitment. It's vows. It's exchanging. It's giving and receiving. It's not just hanging out. The church is filled with hanger outers. All over. Hanging out. But covenant people are relationship. God has given, God has given you a way to come into relationship with Him. He's made covenant. He's vowed Himself to you. And He's waiting for you to vow your life back to Him. Amen. And when you make a vow, that's when you come outside of yourself. I, I no longer get to have everything I want. When I made a vow to my wife, I vowed outside of myself. I no longer get to have all my old friends do my old thing. I gave my life to someone. I've given my life to someone. And I'm going to live new life out of being joined to that person. Are you doing all right? I live my life being joined to that person. I don't just come to Jesus and just say, hey, can we just hang out? Jesus doesn't want to hang out. He doesn't want to just kick it with you. He came to reconcile you to the Father. He's given you the ministry of reconciliation, a renewed and restored relationship with your Heavenly Father. He wants you to know what it's like to be walking in through the garden of your life and hear the voice of God call your name. And you live as a people of God's voice in your life. Are you doing all right? Well, maybe we should preach this outline. So look at the cover with me. I'll go through this quickly. God's people have a decision to make when it comes to how we will face the challenges of life. What will we use as a compass to guide us through the sea of life? Everyone is faced with the same choices and challenges. They may come dressed up differently, but at the core they're the same. They're just challenges of life. Life is filled with challenges. Suck it up. Grow up. Amen. God gives you the ability. He gives you the strength. Think of all the promises God has given you. I'm in covenant with God. God is on my side. Amen. Man has accomplished a lot of great things and has found answers and cures for many of the ailments of life. Come on, we're, they're supposed to be finding a cure. We haven't been able to find a cure for the common flu in 40 years. But amazingly, in 10 months, we've got a cure for a disease that nobody knows they have. I would venture to say that most of the greatest discoveries were connected to a loss which produced determination to do something about it. Many have spent their entire life searching for an answer. Here's my question. What if we were to go after God with the same desire and intensity to understand the surety of His Word and to tap into the power of His covenant promise? What if we went after God like that? Transform our lives. Matthew 8, 17, look at this. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. You know what that is? That's covenant promise. God says, I will take your sicknesses. I will bear your infirmity. I will take your weaknesses. I will take your sickness. And I will bear them in myself. And yet Christians go around claiming all their sickness and disease. My arthritis, my asthma, my diabetes, my this, my that, my this, my that, whatever. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not discrediting anything like that. But why would you claim something that he took and bore for you? Why would you keep calling it yours? Send it back to hell where it came from. Wow, that's kind of radical. Well, then just die. <laughs> Death is pretty radical. Well, you're supposed to be nice. I'd be nice, but cancer's not nice. Heart disease is not nice. All sickness and nothing nice about it. It's the most. De- oh. Isaiah 53 5. He was wounded. He, 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 he was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Matthew 8, 13. Go your way. As you have believed, so let it be done to you. Why are you fighting? Why am I preaching against the battle of unbelief? Because what you believe is what's happening in your life. 
And so you have to attack that. Yes, Mike Florence was asking me the other day, said, what's it mean by, by, by Matthew 11, 12, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by four. The Amplified said the kingdom of God is constantly under violent assault. And if you want to win this battle, you, you have to violently pursue it and diligently go after it. It doesn't come with just compassion. We, we're the most wussified church that's ever lived on the face of the earth. Amen. Time for Christianity to get its manhood back. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll have three friends after today. <laughs> so look at the inside of your outline. God anoints us. He gives us his anointing. The anointing comes to accomplish what is preached. His word was with power. When Jesus spoke, they said he speaks with one with authority and with power. In Acts 10, 38, Jesus, Peter said like this, This Jesus who God anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power went about doing good and healing all, get this, who were oppressed by the devil. If there's oppression working in your life, it's demonic activity. Don't give in to the work of the devil. The Bible says resist him and he will flee from you. But you can't resist him by just kind of hanging out and being casual and doing just that. You you resist him in warfare and being strong in the Lord. Think about it. Isaiah 10, 27 says the yoke is destroyed because of the anointing. So what did Jesus preach? Our message today should not be changed from what he preached. He preached peace with God and restoration and covenant provision. So how are we supposed to stand in the faith of Abraham? I don't have time to read this, but Romans tells us that we're connected to Abraham. And we're supposed to live like Abraham. In Luke 13, Jesus was in church and a woman who was oppressed by the devil whom Satan had bound. Whom Satan had bound. Whom Satan had bound. Give credit to God. Quit saying, well, the Lord will never. People get sick and they say, well, the Lord will never put more on me than I can bear. Oh, so, so God is the one inflicting you with sickness and disease. I, I will not serve a sadistic God. Well, oh, Pastor, you're kind of kicking a lot of sacred cows. Good. They deserve to be kicked. I'm into cow tipping myself. <laughs> Hallelujah. So think about it. Jesus was opposed for what he did in church on Sunday morning. Jesus got in trouble for doing stuff on Sunday morning. Oh, we don't do that stuff in church. Do that someplace else. Don't come in here and heal with her hand. Don't straighten out back. Don't, don't, don't work miracles on church. Don't, don't do any of that stuff on, on church day. Amen. Don't go making me uncomfortable in church and where I have to give up my religion and actually get saved. People had, listen, people had been taught differently than what he was teaching and doing. Hear me. And they had become accustomed to receiving nothing from the Lord. You know where the church is today? Right there. We're accustomed to receiving nothing. They had been taught to tolerate their circumstances. There's so much religion doctrine out there that teaches us to tolerate things. Not fight it. Amen. Amen. Not just act like you've got good sense. And you start standing by faith and people call you radical. Good. I'd rather be radical than that. Amen. Amen? Jesus came and confronted their circumstances with covenant provision and fulfillment of the promise. Say, Pastor, why are you preaching? Because just in a moment, we're going to receive communion together. You're going to declare in receiving these elements, you're in covenant with God and that you are an heir and you have a right to receive. You no longer need to be sick, depressed, oppressed, in fear, in bondage, in any area in your life. You are the redeemed of the Lord. Hallelujah. So the word of God is still anointed today. This is still Jesus' ministry. He is still preaching to us. It is the same message of peace that comes through standing by faith in Jesus. We are no longer, as we read it, covenant strangers. His word is still with power. It's the word that carries power, not a special man. We've gotten into celebrity Christianity. Well, if I can get to this person's meeting, if I can get to that, if I can just have that person. God is not into celebrities. He's into you and his word getting in you. 
Amen. I, I'm all for laying. I love laying on hands. We're going to lay hands on people today. We're going to break some things today in Jesus' name. But God wants you to get to the place where you're not relying upon anything, but you have a personal relationship with him, and you know who you are in Christ, and you live by the manifestation of his word that's on the inside of you, and out of that you can then lead others into a relationship with him. You see, there's special ministries, but they will fail without the word. There are ministries that are set in the church, and these special ministries work at times as the Spirit will. Listen, the manifestation, the manifestation of the Spirit manifests Himself just to help you have faith in God. We don't live by miracles. Pastor Tim shared it in the offering a few weeks ago. In going through the wilderness, God does things in wilderness. If you need a miracle all the time, you're in a wilderness. Because miracles happen in places where natural provision and sowing and reaping is impossible. But if I'm living in the promised land, I'm in a land where everything I sow multiplies back to me, glory to God. I'm living in the abundance of God. I don't need a miracle. I'm blessed. Wow. So think about it. The word will work at all times. For anyone who will stand up. See, if it's just special men, then i got to find a special man. If it's just special ministries and manifestation, then i got to be where that's in manifestation. But if it's the Word, the Word works always. We had a great time Monday night in our men's Bible study, and we started talking about, uh, uh, Joe asked how, how we have a desire for more of the Word. You just need this revelation. You know what you are? You are God's desired deposit for His Word. This is what God has declared. See, it, 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 and it came about because somebody's talking about if they got some money, what they would do with it. So if you're smart, you won't just waste it. Yeah. If you're smart, and, and so I, I put out there what, what, I, what I answered. They put a post out there, so I answered it. Well, I would tithe the first percent. I'd save the next 10%, and I'd try to invest the next 10%, so that would leave me with 70%. People try to live on 100% and figure out how to do something with the rest of nothing. But you have to, anyway, so, so in doing that, but if you're going to invest it in order for what you have to increase, in order for anything you have to increase, it has to go someplace where it can produce increase. In order for anything you have to increase, it has to move away from you. It has to move away from you and be placed somewhere where it can increase, where interest can compound. This is what God had said. God said, in order for my kingdom to increase, it has to move away from me. And the place I've ordained and designed for my kingdom to increase is in each and every one of you. So for my word to increase, I will deposit into your life. And when my word gets deposited into your life, it will produce some 30 some 60 and 100 fold. Because I've made you the ground of increase. Well, I just don't have any motivation to read my Bible. Are you stinking kidding me? You're God's ground of increase. God's chosen you to be the ground of his increase. Everything connected to my life that you would call ministry is just me believing that God would deposit his word in my life and I would allow the word that I have received to flow with increase through my life. Everything you do for God is the increase of his word coming through. But think about that. The Bible says about Jesus, he's coming and, and of the increase of his kingdom. There will be no, of the increase of his kingdom, there will be no end. Jesus said, my kingdom isn't without, my kingdom is within you. So get this, believer. God said, I'm going to extend my word into you. The only place my word can increase. I've ordained this whole thing to work. By placing my kingdom in you for increase. And then people go, why is it taking so long for the Lord to return? Because he's only coming through you. Everything he set in motion to happen for the fulfillment of the plan has to come through us. Amen. And when we get in agreement, then we'll see the fulfillment of all things. Are you with me this morning? Yeah. Man, this is so good. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
I wish I could find this stuff out by myself. <laughs> Amen. The Holy Ghost is awesome. Amen. Listen to what I'm telling you. Because the guy said, hey, when you get hungry for God and you just get diving in, God just says, he'll, he'll increase himself through your life. See, we, we talk ourselves out of being vessels of increase. We, we talk all of our inadequacies to God. I'd go a garden, but I, that's just terrible dirt. That dirt will never produce anything. Waste of time putting any seed in there. That's the way we talk about our lives. God said, I formed you out of third day soil. Genesis chapter 1. The earth is formed on the third day to receive seed and bring forth harvest. Then God formed man out of the dust. You're formed to receive seed and bring forth. You're formed to produce increase. The increase of his word. There's a reason God formed you out of soil. Then Jesus came and said the word of God is seed to be sown in your heart. Are you doing all right? When I just get into agreement with God and his word, everything changes. Amen. But, but let me just help you right here. See, this is where the battle for unbelief has to be in your mind. You've been raised to be dependents. You're living in a culture right now, and, and there's trying to be a governmental shift that makes you completely dependent on an outside force to provide for every need of your life. For you to look outside to government to provide for your health, your wealth, your job, your, 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 your everything. You're not created to look outside anywhere. God's put everything you need on the inside of you. Oh, my God. Oh, man. All right, look at this. So we stand... The word of God always works. This is our battleground. This can be declared without reservation because the covenant promise and provision of God is his body and his blood that we're going to remember this morning. So get this. Our struggle is not with God. We are not in a confrontation with God. The battle is against our unbelief. Those thoughts and ideas and concepts in our minds that speak against the word of God and render the covenant non-effective in our life. Our battles are against the Goliaths in, the li in life that come out to defy the armies of God. Whenever there is a challenge, we will have to determine how we will respond. I'm, I'm just amazed at the response of the church globally to COVID. I'll just leave it at that. Whenever there is a challenge, we'll have to determine how we will respond. Always remember, we're not fighting a single battle, but we are in a war. Wars are not won or lost by one victory or one defeat. In the day that Christ walked the earth, people had become accustomed to living in defeat because the word of God had made no, been made of no effect by the traditions of men. It's the same today. All over. There are churches actually preaching that none of this stuff is available today. See, Jesus fought to break through that barrier and reaffirm the covenant promises of God to his people. Jesus came beating against the religious philosophy of his day, just like the word of God is doing today. Can you say amen? So what is it? The power was present to heal. The power of God is present to heal because God is present to perform and keep his covenant promise. Think about Bartimaeus there and everything that happened. Jesus said power, or the woman with the issue of blood. He says power has gone out of me. Power was available. Nobody was making a demand. God's power and ability are not manifested. Get there. God's power and ability are not manifested until the demand is placed upon his promise. There's a difference between a demand and a just asking. Bartimaeus said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Jesus calls him. This is what he said. What do you want me to do for you? He did not beat around the bush. He didn't him haw. What did he say? He made a demand. He placed a demand upon Jesus to be who he is. When Jesus stopped and said, bring him to me, he acknowledged, I am the son of David. I am your covenant redeemer. Amen. 
then Bartimaeus knew he had the right to, to demand. In covenant, you get to demand. Not just ask. You get to demand. That's why Jesus said, if you ask the Father in my name, it, that, that word ask there means like one king making a demand upon another king. He said, I want to see. When's the last time you talked to God like that? Well, I would never talk to God like that. Well, stay sick. Oh, pastor, you're getting to, you're putting all the responsibility on me. No, I'm just telling you you're in covenant. You're in covenant. We, we don't, we, our culture understands nothing about covenant and our right, so we tolerate and we've been told if you stand in that, you're arrogant, you're proudful, you're everything else. Start calling yourself the covenant, that, start calling on the inheritance that you have in Christ. Live by it and declare. Be, 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 well, what right do I have? Just look right over here at the cross. I'll tell you what right you have. You have a Savior who hung there and died there and bore everything there and nailed every ordinance that was against you. He nailed it to the cross and he triumphed over principalities and power. He gave you the victory. You have every right in Christ. Hey, Ben, how many are getting requests from your killed children for Christmas? Those aren't requests, those are demands. <laughs> they, they don't come going, well, you know, if it might be possible, I don't know. And if you feel like doing it, could you possibly? They just say, I want. <laughs> Hello? And they I want. And then when you tell them, they, 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 and then when you tell them how much it is, well, it's not that much. Well, I'm glad you think that's not that much. Why do they do that? Because they're your children. And they know their connection with you. You're a child of God. You have every right to say, I want to see. I want to be healed. I refuse to tolerate anymore. Are you getting this this morning? So think about it. No one, go, go with me to Luke chapter 5 real quick. Luke chapter 5. In dealing with the woman with the issue of blood. Watch this real quick. Verse 17, now it happened on a certain day as Jesus was teaching that there were certain Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, not, not the women, but the, the paralytic, seeing churches sitting by, seeing who had come out of every town and Galilean region, and the, why, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Jesus is teaching, all these people there just listening to you, and the power of the Lord is present to heal. But watch, nobody's getting healed. The power of the Lord is present to heal, but nobody's getting anything. Nothing's happening until, until, verse 18. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before Jesus. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went on the housetop and let him down in his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, they said, we understand who he is, and we understand what he can do, and our friend needs a miracle, and we refuse to be denied by a crowd. The power of the Lord is present to heal. Nobody's getting anything, but as soon as faith comes into the room and a demand is made on the covenant provision, somebody gets healed. Amen. Amen. So think about it. The woman with the issue of blood made a demand on that power, blind Bartimaeus, the Tim Leopard, the centurion, Jerry Iris for his daughter, the father for a lunatic child. They all did so, not even knowing at time they had a birthright to the promise. If we would become convinced of our birthright in Christ, things would change dramatically. Power that flows without a demand being placed upon it is wild and destructive and not of God. We want God just to let his power flow, like cutting down a power line. You ever see a power line go down just whips all over like that just go grab that sucker you'll feel the power 
But it's dangerous and destructive. Power is channeled and it flows. And God ordained that you are the power grid. You're, You're God's power grid in the earth. And he causes his power to flow through our lives. Glory to God. That's good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. I know every now and then stuff just flies in there. It scares me. Amen. But watch this. Because electricity upon demand produces light and heat. But electricity uncontrolled produces fire and death. See, what we want is we want God to release his power uncontrolled so it doesn't require anything of us. Nothing in the way of commitment, transformation, sanctification, holiness, or any type of lifestyle with God. No change to us. Just let the power flow meet my need. God perform for me. Doing all right? Amen. So the word of God still carries power to heal, deliver, and to set free. The anointing still breaks the yoke. We have a birthright to walk in the provisions of the covenant that God made with us. With his son on our behalf through his body and his blood. Hear me this morning. We can plug into the power and the covenant promise of God. If a man in the natural can give his whole life to search for a natural cure for the ailments of humanity. How much more should we live to see the fulfillment of God's promise come to pass in the lives of his people. Now I'm going to close right here and we're going to receive communion. And then God's going to do, some of you are going to get a breakthrough this morning. I felt the Holy Spirit tell me to put this at the end and to preach this and and, and, uh, then then to pray over communion this morning in this way. Come on, today you're entering, you're renewing, remembering your covenant with God. Come on, if you have your Bible, just take your Bible. This is your will. This is God's will. It's written, it's His will written to you and in it, it contains everything you need for life. God God has given us everything. Look at Peter said like that. God has given unto us everything that pertains to life and godliness. It's in the will. It's in the will. See, people say, well, why are you acting like that? Because I got written in a will. Why why, are you acting? I'm an heir. I'm sorry, I'm an heir. I just inherited. I'm just living in my inheritance. I'm sorry, you don't know you have one. You want to be inherited? My, my, My dad is into adopting there's, lot, there's plenty of room in my father's house. I know, I know he'd receive you. He, he's the God of adoption. You want to be adopted by my father? Amen. Maybe you're here today. I, I'm going to challenge you right now. If you're here today and you've just been a hanger-outer, just hanging out in church, doing church, but never committing and making a vow of your life to God, today's your day, guy. Today's your day. You need to make a vow with your life to God. God, I'll give you my life. Amen. I'll, I'll tell you, the, the main reason marriages fail, because people don't mean what they say. You didn't mean what you said. If you meant what you said, you can't leave. Oh, well, you know, I don't care. Get mad at me all you want. Amen. I made, I made a vow to that woman right there. Amen. I made, I made a vow to her. And don't... don't, don't, don't mess with me. I, I went through a divorce. I know what I'm talking about. I, I learned by failure. And, and that brokenness, that failure is, is, is when I came to Christ. And I said, God, I don't want to fail anymore. And the Lord showed me what I did wrong. He showed me why my marriage failed. He showed me exactly, no, 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 nothing on the other person, 100% on me, why my marriage failed. Say, God, I don't want to live as a failure any longer. So I made a vow to my wife. I will live with you and live for you the rest of my life. There's certain things that I I have to give up because I made a vow. And when I come to Christ, that's what I say. When we come to Christ out of our brokenness, out of our failure, we say, Jesus, I don't want to live in that brokenness anymore. I'm making a vow. I'm married to you. That's why you're called the body of Christ, the bride. And he is your husband. And you enter into a marriage relationship with you and you become one with him. And so you need to be joined to Christ and give your life to him. And things turn around. Are you doing all right? 
Say, Pastor, you're getting really, really personal. Good. Amen. Listen to these verses. Listen to these verses. Exodus 23. So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and he will take sickness away from the midst of you. None of you shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land, and I will fulfill the number of your days. You want to know how long I'm living? To my full number. That's how long I'm living. I'm living to my full number, glory to God. That's why I tell you say it all the time. I'm in my prime. Amen. I still got a big number in front of me. Amen? Amen. Lord Terry, I'm, I'm doing it. Amen. And the, well, I better not say that. <laughs> but, see, my, my number will get shorter if people will receive the kingdom in them and start producing it. I don't have to live longer here if we'll just be the ground of increase to produce the kingdom. Are you doing all right? Because we can bring things to culmination. Look at Psalms 107, verses 19 20. They cried unto the walk, they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works. To the children of men, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Listen to this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Glory to God. Say this with me. Youth possesses me. Glory to God. Doesn't that sound better than, oh, man, I'm getting so old. (laughs) Amen. Just go stand over in that corner by yourself. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. Now listen, listen. Here's the reality. If healing came through the covenant, sealed in the blood. Every promise is right there, is sealed in the blood of animals. Come on, Usher. Every, every promise right there, sealed in the blood of animals. Jesus is a mediator of a whole other covenant. So how much more, how much more is a covenant sealed in the body and the blood of his son? Able to produce in your life. You're called into a relationship with the covenant God. Stand to your feet with me. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father. Today. I choose. In a vow. To declare. My life. Is totally yours from this day forward. I believe you've given me your life through your Son, Jesus Christ. So today I vow to give my life to you. In Jesus' name, I receive your forgiveness for my sin. I receive the cleansing of your blood. My reconciliation and restoration into relationship with the Father. Today, I am forgiven. From this day forward, I will live to honor my vow to you. In Jesus' name, thank you for my inheritance in your covenant. In Jesus' name, name. amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to be real serious. If you did not mean that, do not take communion. The Bible says, if I do not discern the Lord's body, that I could literally eat and drink damnation to myself. That I could literally become sick and die prematurely for not respecting the vow of a covenant. 
But if you mean that, then today, take everything that God has declared as yours. Refuse from this day forward to ever doubt His love and His promise fulfilled in your life. Would you step out to your left and come receive communion and the ushers to serve you? David, go ahead and play that. We're going to pray together and God's going to do something here in just a moment. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare You're our living hope Your presence I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free yeah, my shame is undone In your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere Your glory Father, I thank you today. I want you to take the bread in your hands right now. Father, today we hold this emblem of remembrance. Lord, we hold this bread in our hands to cause us to remember that your body, as you said, was broken for us. That you went through complete brokenness your body beaten, wounded, torn apart, suffered, everything you endured was so that you could make a covenant with us to be made whole. Father, today we remember 
we hold something that makes us remember you made us whole Jesus you're our wholeness our completeness forgive us of ever doubted the wholeness of completeness of your love and our redemption in Jesus name do you receive this bread with me Father, we hold in our hands the blood, the symbol of the blood that was shed on our behalf. And Lord, your word says that the blood speaks of better things than the blood of Abel. Father, Abel's blood cried out for justice. Your blood cries out that justice has been met. Your blood declares that we are forgiven, we are redeemed, we are covered, we are justified. Never again have to try to be right. You've covered us and made us right. You've forgiven us. You've washed us with your blood. And your blood is the ink that you signed your name to the covenant. And it's by your blood that you write our names. You write our name in the Lamb's book of life with the ink of your redeeming blood. Thank you, Father. We are the redeemed of the Lord. And it is your blood that speaks on our behalf. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask Cole and Pastor Tim to come join me up here. And we're just going to lay hands on in agreement. If you're ready to place a demand on covenant on any area of your life, if you're here and you just want to come forward and say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. I made a vow today. I've given Jesus Christ my life. I vowed my life to him. I just want to tell you, I want you to pray and agree with me. Then I want to pray with you. But if you want us to pray with you and lay hands on you in agreement for a demand for healing to break everything off your life, then come line up across here right now. God's going to do something right now in this place today in Jesus' name. Come on, this is a, an anointing service.